like ha can you believe they missed that referring to the uh, Hans Blix team of UN inspectors who have been looking for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or evidence uh, that the weapons of mass destruction Iraq was known to possess in 1998 that those weapons have been destroyed so far that evidence has not been provided Hans Blix is sounding more and more frustrated with the lack of cooperation uh, from the Iraqis. Uh, ambassador David Sheffer, former uh, war crimes ambassador at large, is with us, uh, still keeping an eye on the Powell speech. Um, Mr. Ambassador, how direct, how blunt do you expect him to be? Is he going to couch this in diplomatic language, or is he going to say, look, you know, the guy can't be trusted, he's a liar? What's it going to sound like? You know, Secretary Powell has the amazing talent to be both blunt and diplomatic all in the same statement. He did this during the Persian Gulf War. You might recall that briefing uh, militarily where he said, first we're going to cut him off and then we're going to kill him. But the whole rest of the briefing was quite diplomatic uh, in terms of a, of a military briefing. So he has the ability to find the line or the two lines that will capture the attention and seize the headlines. And you might see something like that today in his delivery. How much uh, nervousness, I guess, is there, or anticipation maybe, among some of those heavyweight diplomats that you said have flown in for this speech? How, how, what are they expecting to hear? What are they feeling this morning? Well, they're probably in a very awkward position in that chamber because many of them, particularly the German uh, foreign minister and others, have articulated very skeptical views about the American initiative with respect to Iraq. But I must say, I think there's going to be a good dynamic in the Council today. First, the United States brings a discipline to the Council in terms of bringing Iraq front and center, and has been for months. That's good for the Council. But at the same time, the Security Council and our allies and friends on the Council bring a discipline to the American initiative. Namely, how do you build a coalition? How do you build the kind of support and make the case for a military action and enforcement action, as Senator Biden said this morning, that is, uh, appears so imminent? How do you make that case and persuade others? The council provides that form. That's its purpose, is to bring those arguments together and see if you can prevail in that form with a solid case. We've done it before many times in the history of the United Nations. This is another critical historic moment when we need to be as persuasive as possible in order to build that coalition. But as we've noted, Iraq has already tried to pre-butt what, uh, what the secretary will have to say, uh, calling these you know, lies mm -hmm. and deceptions and so forth. Have they succeeded in planting some seeds of doubt? I really don't think so. You know, I don't think there's any government there that holds the brief for the Iraqi government. Everyone is skeptical of the Iraqi government. And the Security Council has been quite unified ever since the Gulf War on seeking to discipline Iraq and enforce its resolutions. The problem is, has the Security Council taken the final step to bring this to closure? That's what the United States has brought to the Council, but now it needs to be persuasive enough uh, that uh, it makes the case that military action is actually required now as opposed to perhaps six months, eight months, or 12 months from now. That's the test. Ambassador David Sheffer, thanks for being our guest this morning. Thank you. 32 minutes away now from the biggest speech of Colin Powell's career, he will try to convince the UN Security Council that Saddam Hussein has been stiffing, stalling, sandbagging, whatever the term is that you want to choose, he has been putting it to the United Nations inspectors. Secretary Powell says he has the evidence. Select members of Congress like Joe Biden have already seen it this morning. They say with that, Joe Biden said he could get a conviction. Let's turn it over to my colleague Shepard Smith for special coverage of Secretary of State of State Colin Powell at the UN. That coverage starts now. You are looking live, the United Nations in New York, where Secretary of State Colin Powell is set to lay out the case against Iraq. U.S. officials tell Fox News the Secretary of State is armed with the voice recordings of intercepted communications caught on tape. The Iraqis, in their own words, trying to deceive the United Nations. You are looking live inside the building where the Secretary of State Colin Powell has just arrived. This one of the most important speeches by an American at the United Nations in recent memory. Now the head inspector, Hans Blix, warning Saddam 
that time is running out. Isn't there five minutes to midnight in your political assessments? The diplomatic window is closing. It closes. The Secretary of State Colin Powell presents the case against Iraq. This is Fox News Channel's special coverage of Secretary of State Colin Powell's address to the United Nations Security Council. Now from New York, Shepard Smith. And good morning from New York, 10 o'clock in the east now, 7 o'clock in the west, five minutes to midnight, as Hans Blix put it, inside Baghdad. The case to be made today, he must not prove, the Iraqis must in the end prove that they are disarmed, that they are cooperating, and at this moment, they are playing by United Nations rules. So far, they have not made that case. The Secretary of State Colin Powell to make his today. The exact details of what we will learn still undecided, but as you can see, Colin Powell now walking live through the corridors, and he's expected to begin in just about 30 minutes. The, this event to begin at 10.15 local time uh, with the opening statements, and we are expecting that we may in fact hear from Kofi Annan himself. We have a team of experts and correspondents on standby this morning. Let's begin with our senior correspondent, Eric Sean, who's live at the United Nations. Hello, Eric. Hello, Shepard. It is now time for Colin Powell to lay out his case. What the administration says is the proof that Saddam Hussein and Iraq has been violating Resolution 1441 thumbing their nose at the world body and the globe. The audience that uh, Colin Powell will try and present this information to, not just the diplomats and foreign ministers in the Security Council, but also world opinion. We should look out for uh, s several key points when he makes his presentation, expected to last about 90 minutes or so. One of the uh, people who will be inside listening very intently to what Secretary Powell has to say will be Hans Blix, the Chief Weapons Inspector. He has said that he would like to have more information on sites that the Americans suspect are sites of weapons of mass destruction, such as laboratories and the like. Hans Blick saying he believes that the Iraqis have been bugging his inspectors in their hotel rooms and in their offices. Blick's making it very clear here yesterday in his own words that this timeline shows it is now five minutes to midnight in his diplomatic jargon, meaning the end is very close for the end of diplomatic discussions before potential military action. Powell will be trying to present the case to the 11 nations on the 15-member Security Council who have been saying to give the inspectors more time and who are against immediate military action. So far, the U.S., Britain, Spain, and Bulgaria are four of the 15 nations that have taken the toughest line against Iraq. Powell speaking to the other nations, trying to sway their views that uh, Iraq should have more time. Shepard. All right, Eric Sean, live at the United Nations. Let's go live now to our senior White House correspondent, Jim Angle, who's on the North Lawn this hour. Jim. Hello, Chef. Well, Secretary of State Powell is clearly the greatest champion in this administration of diplomatic efforts, but he'll go to the U.N. today and say that he is not working, that Iraq is not cooperating and shows no signs of its intention to cooperate, making a very tough case that one senator said up here this morning after he was briefed on what Powell is likely to say, that he could get a jury conviction if this were a jury trial based on the evidence Powell will present, but noted that Powell will face a much tougher jury. That is why the United States has decided to declassify all sorts of intelligence, including SHEP, as we reported last night, that they will actually play recordings of intercepted communications between Iraqi officials trying to deceive the arms inspectors. This is the first time since 1983 when Soviet pilots shot down a civilian airliner and intercepts showed that they knew it was a civilian airliner. The first time since 1983 that the U.S. has actually played communications intercepts, very sensitive intelligence. There will also be satellite photos. There will be reports from defectors about mobile biochemical labs uh, and a good deal of detail on that. There was a long and serious debate, Shep, as you know, over whether or not and how much to declassify intelligence. It is a rare thing, says one official. It is not done every day, but there are times when it is important for a key historical moment that appears to be one of these days. That This day appears to be one of those days, Shep. All right, Jim Angle live for us at the White House. Jim, thanks very much. Let's go to Greg Palcott now, our Fox News correspondent who's live inside Baghdad. Greg? 
Hey, Shepard, lies and fabrications. That's what the Iraqi media is already calling that evidence soon to be put before the U.N. Security Council by Secretary of State Colin Powell. The morning newspapers here is filled with diatribes against Powell and the information that he will be presenting. Uh, the attention being given, the huge amount of attention being given to this presentation, a sign of how crucial the regime here sees this event. One newspaper declaring that all the images, all the audio tapes will be fabricated. The Iraqi people will not be allowed to watch this live. They can't take international news channels in on their televisions, but at least two top A's to Iraqi President Saddam Hussein will be watching. We will be watching with them. We will give you their reaction to the real thing as soon as we have it. Meanwhile, uh, the weapons inspections, what this is really all about, continue today. Uh, inspectors visiting several sites, including the main uh, nuclear facility for uh, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein's uh, nuclear program, uh, also a another facility regarding uh, biological weapons and also a laser research center. Yesterday, yet another undeclared chemical warhead was discovered at another facility. Finally, it was a family affair on Iraqi television last night. In attendance yesterday, what's become regularly aired meetings between Saddam Hussein and his security staff, his two sons, Uday, who is the head of uh, one very tough commando unit called Saddam's Martyr Martyrs, and Kuze, who is uh, the heir apparent deemed here anyway. They are apparent to Saddam Hussein, and he also runs the Special Republican Guards, that very elite unit. Once again, Shepard, uh, the uh, evidence uh, to be presented by Secretary of State Powell uh, being watched very closely here uh, already has been slammed. We'll be giving you the reaction as soon as we get it. Back to you. All right, Greg Palcott live inside Baghdad. Of course, we're expecting to hear from a, an official from inside Iraq as well today. The Iraqis uh, asked to make a speech today, though they don't really have to make the request. They're certainly entitled to do so, and we're expecting that sometime later in the morning, if not in the early afternoon. And after, we'll, of course, go back to our correspondent, Greg Palcott, to our bureau inside Baghdad to keep tabs on what's happening there. In the meantime, Bill Crystal's joining me now, the former chief of staff uh, for the vice president under Bush 41, who's sort of seen this come and go before. How important a speech is this? Well, it's quite important, though, on the other hand, I think we've made a lot of progress with those Europeans with whom we can't make progress already. The European Union has a statement today seeming to me to move towards supporting the U.S. ultimately through the Security Council. We'll have a letter, I guess, from 10 more European nations joining the eight who've already signed a different letter basically supporting President Bush. On the other hand, this is national, international television. Uh, so, and Powell will make a strong case, I think. I read a poll this morning. I believe it was from... Uh Zogby, though I'm, I'm not entirely sure of that, it said nine out of ten Americans see the speech as a, a lynch, a turning point for them on their feelings about Iraq. I guess that's one audience. Is the French a bigger audience? Or is France a bigger audience? Yeah, well, the French government. I mean, I think, in truth, if, if Powell makes a compelling presentation, which I expect him to do, uh, it'll give the French government an excuse to come back to support us if they want to, which we're not sure about, though I rather expect they will. I think they'll decide to be in on the play at the end of the day instead of uh, posturing out there against us. The one thing I would say, having been in government a little bit, is, is this. Uh, there will be people who will snipe at Powell and say, we no smoking gun, there's certain evidence that we've heard about that he didn't present, but we're going to be at war in four or six weeks. And Secretary of State Powell, former General Colin Powell, is not going to risk American lives for the sake of making the French government a little happier. And if we know where a mobile biological weapons lab is through overhead surveillance or through intercepts, and we don't believe the Iraqi government knows that we know that, we're not going to release that information because we want to attack that lab on the first day of the war and save potentially a heck of a lot of American and Iraqi lives. So I think you're going to see this government quite properly, this administration, err on the side of caution. They'll release intercepts where it's Iraqi soldiers laughing about how they've uh, hid, uh, hid weapons from the inspectors. They'll release photography that's, not of, that's of sites that the Iraqis know we're photographing. But I don't think people should expect to see a real aha type of information because that would risk American lives and I don't think we're going to do that just for the sake of making a couple of European governments happy. It's my understanding that as late as last night there were still discussions from the, the two sides in this game about how much to allow out and how much not to. I'm guessing there's a real push by the folks who handle the PR, right. by the folks who want to influence public opinion to get a lot out and the military on the, on the other hand saying wait just a minute. 
and President Bush, I think, making that decision. And he knows we are very, very likely to be at war. And as I say, I do not believe he's going to risk American lives for the sake of, you know, allegedly influencing some of European public opinion. Jim Engels at the White House. Jim, it, it's, it's been my sense, at least, that this president had made a decision a long time ago that he's going to do what he believes is best here, no matter what the rest think. Well, that's right, Shep, and he has said that repeatedly, but clearly the preference is to get as many people in the coalition as possible. The other preference, of course, is to put enough pressure on Saddam Hussein that he might actually turn around. No one expects that to happen. Uh, and all of those hopes have been dashed repeatedly, so no one really anticipates that Saddam will suddenly get religion here at the 11th hour. But the president has made clear he will go forward if necessary. Uh, what Bill was saying about uh, the great care with uh, declassifying intelligence is absolutely true. There was great care in this case, but officials acknowledge that, look, there are times when it is necessary to share some of that intelligence to let the public know what you have. They take great care because, of course, it is through enormous effort and risk that that intelligence is gathered. You do not want to do anything that suggests to the people you're surveilling, in this case the Iraqis, how it is that you're on to them, what it is that you watch for. But uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, there are moments in history, said an official, when it is necessary to use this intelligence. This is clearly one of those moments. But they also caution that there are things that will not be as big Bill suggested sort of whiz-bang things. Uh, for instance, the Secretary of State will use satellite photos today. Satellite photos uh, are usually uh, analyzed by experts who spend hours, days, even weeks going over them, uh, looking at them very carefully and analyzing them. It is not the sort of thing that is immediately obvious to the public, so there will be a good deal of explanation that will go with those today, Shep. Yeah, I, I, thanks, Jim. Thanks very much. We're going to talk to Bob Baer in just a moment, who's a former CIA operative and who's who's uh, intimately familiar with the, the gathering process of, of this sort of intelligence, both on the ground and from the skies. But first, I want to try and shape the importance of what's going to happen today and put into a little bit of context. And I thought a very quick interview, if you want to call it that, that our senior correspondent Eric Sean had with Colin Powell just yesterday w w uh, told the whole story. Uh, Eric Sean said to Colin Powell, the Iraqis now say that they don't have any weapons of mass destruction and that they have no links to al-Qaeda. And, and uh, Colin Powell yelled across the, the car to Eric Sean, prove it. Uh, that's Eric Sean pretty much what all this boils down to. It is not for the United Nations to prove here. It's for Saddam Hussein to prove here. Lose when they're uh, analyzing this, that it's not up for the inspectors to go out on what the president called a scavenger hunt, looking for material. The onus is on Saddam Hussein and Iraq. The onus is not on the inspectors or the Security Council or even the U.S. There are basically have been just four countries on the 15-member Security Council who completely publicly understand that. Those four nations are the U.S., Britain, Bulgaria, and Spain. The 11 other nations have been saying that they want to wait for the inspectors to try and find material, see what the inspectors can dig up and discover, like it's some cat and mouse, uh, you know, game out there in, in the desert of Iraq. So uh, that is something that is lost, and I think that Secretary Powell will bluntly make the point here yet again, as he did here two weeks ago when he was caught off guard by the French foreign minister, that the onus is not on the United Nations, but it is on Iraq to comply and for Iraq to prove that it no longer has any weapons of mass destruction. It is a view also, Shep, that uh, Hans Blix has, has believed in and has also uh, coincides with uh, saying that it is up to Iraq to cooperate. Blix telling me that uh, he has been unsatisfied with Iraqi cooperation. Uh, he has decided in the past not to go back to Baghdad unless they change their attitude in his words. He is returning at the end of this week one more time for one one last visit. Uh, theoretically, he hopes to get those U-2 overflights and the private interviews with scientists. Uh, but today here at the Royal Body, not much hope that Blix will be able to achieve that at all when he returns to Baghdad over this weekend. One final point I want to bring out, and that is that in all the uh, analysis of this, 
some of these countries really are on the same page much more than you would think. Diplomatic sources telling me that the Security Council split is not as serious as the media makes it out to be, that you have to remember that even those nations such as uh, Russia, China and France that do not want military action now have decided uh, and publicly say that the inspector should be given weeks, if not months, keep that eye on the term weeks. That's where diplomatic negotiation is concerned. The U.S. says weeks. These nations say weeks. So they do at least have some type of tacit agreement uh, that there will be a few more weeks in this drama, but not much time left after that. Eric Sean at the United Nations. Eric, thanks. Our, our folks at the White House uh, have just been a part of an off-camera briefing. Uh, they call it the Daily Gaggle, which happens every morning. And Jim Engel, our senior White House correspondent, just gotten some new information there. Jim, what are you learning? Well, Shep, what the administration is saying is that the president uh, sees this entire process as one of consultation. Uh, this will begin. Powell's presentation this morning will begin an intense round of consultation. In fact, he is scheduled to have 10 meetings just today on this material. This is clearly the kickoff of a campaign to convince nations there that it does not appear that Saddam Hussein is willing to do what he has to do, and if he is not, they have to face the facts. Now, the interesting point here is that Powell is key to this. He is widely respected in international circles. He is the one seen as the one most reluctant to go to war, who was not eager to go to war at the outset. Uh, some other members of the administration are viewed that way by the international community. So Powell has the most credibility of anyone in this administration when he says that diplomacy and inspections are not working and have no prospect of working, that carries a lot of weight. What they hope to do here is to begin to convince the members of the Security Council that is the case. Diplomatic sources tell us that many nations agree with the U.S. that Iraq must disarm and that it is not yet doing so, but they are not quite to the point, say a number of sources, that they are willing to say it's all off. Even the Germans, who are absolutely opposed to military action, uh, one of their, their uh, U.N. representatives said yesterday, Shep, that most of the delegations feel, let's give it another chance before we break it off before we break it off. So there is a sense, even among those who are skeptical about military action, that this is moving toward a confrontation, but that there is still a little bit more to be said. They will be listening very closely to what Secretary Powell has to say today, and those who want to change their minds will find plenty in what Powell says to hang their hat on. Shep? Jim Angle at the White House. Jim, thanks. I Bill Crystal, I haven't heard one nation make the argument that they are cooperating, that they are disarming, that they are being uh, living up to the letter of the UN resolution. Well, what they say is let's give the inspectors more time, and that's why this one particular aspect of Powell's presentation is important. If he has really incontrovertible evidence that the Iraqis are subverting the inspections process, let's leave aside whether inspections could work even if the, in a huge country like Iraq, even if the Iraqis were really cooperating. If the Iraqis have bugged the inspectors' meeting rooms or have penetrated the inspection teams, and when, before inspectors come somewhere, the Iraqis are moving stuff away, that makes it impossible for the inspections to work. I mean, that by itself, I think, is a total, you know, should, should be definitive and dispositive, right? I mean, if the Iraqis have nothing to hide, why are they hiding things? Well, the British reported just the other day that, in fact, they were bugging the conference rooms, that, in fact, they were bugging their cars, that, in fact, they were tape recording their conversations. In order to move stuff and hide stuff before the inspectors get somewhere, and I think all the Secretary of State has to say is, if they have nothing to hide, why are they hiding things? And, and the, those countries who have said, well, let's give the inspections a chance, how can you give the inspectors a chance if the Iraqis are f frustrating the inspectors uh, and making it impossible for the inspectors to do their job? So in that respect, I think Powell's presentation and the evidence he will have of Iraqi obstruction of the inspections gives a lot of other nations an excuse, in a sense, to say, okay, the inspections didn't work, we made a good faith effort, and now we can authorize uh, the use of force through the UN Security Council. From reading Le Mans and some of the rest, it would seem that in France, at least, what the people are looking for is not so much evidence of, of lack of cooperation and the rest, but what they're looking for is ties to Al-Qaeda. How far can Colin Powell go today in making a link to Al-Qaeda? Well, there's no question there are links. I don't think he can prove that Iraq uh, was directly involved in September 11th. He can certainly prove that Iraq has links to terrorist groups, including al-Qaeda. Um, that's not necessary for the UN security resolution, which is entirely focused on the weapons of mass destruction issue and Saddam's obligation to disarm. 
but I think he will also suggest correctly that there are links with terrorists and that makes Saddam's failure to disarm even more dangerous. Mm, we're just getting a bulletin now from Reuters television news service that uh, the Turkish parliament is to vote on opening bases to the United States troops on February 18th. It sounds on a diplomatic level like we've gotten to a point where that will probably happen, no? Oh yeah, I believe it will. The Bush administration, which is so often accused of being heavy-handed and unilateralist, has actually over the last month or two been quite adept diplomatically. I would argue they've got most of the neighboring states on board. Turkey's going to come through. Jordan's okay. The Saudis are now saying that if the UN Security Council authorizes it, they'll be okay with us using their bases, if not for attacking, at least for reconnaissance and other things. Um, I think this presentation will give, as I say, a lot of the members of the Security Council a chance to come on board. I think you might end up with a, quite a huge coalition behind, behind the U.S. in this effort. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes past 6 o'clock, I believe, right now in Baghdad, <clears throat> excuse me, where Iraqi officials, as you see on the left-hand side of your screen there, are gathered around a television set watching this. Uh, this U.N. speech to be broadcast to uh, more than 100 countries, it's my understanding, and probably officials from, from every nation on the planet will be watching today. Jim Engel at the White House, I know that uh, the administration is, is well aware of... of uh, more than the facts of this message, uh, of, the, of today's speech, uh, the message that's sent out, the tone of it, uh, they want to put forward a statement today that says, we're through playing. That's right, Shep. Uh, th what they want to demonstrate flatly here is not just that the Iraqis not are, co uh, are not cooperating, but that the Iraqis have no intention of cooperating. As Bill said a moment ago, the question keeps being asked, well, why not give the inspectors more time? And it is probably true that the inspectors would over time find an odd missile warhead here and there uh, as they did yesterday, but that is not the point in the U.S. view. The point is Iraq has to cooperate under Resolution 1441. There is no indication they're going to cooperate, so American officials ask and Secretary Powell will make the case that what more time do we need? How much more time does Iraq need to decide that it must cooperate? That is the key question that Powell has been trying to raise with the Security Council. It is not a question of how much more time the inspectors need. It is a question of how much more time Iraq needs to actually make the decision that it must cooperate with the arms inspectors. And Powell will make a compelling case, American officials say today, that Iraq has made no such decision and in fact all of the evidence points to the fact that they have no intention of cooperating, that they have, uh, in fact, created an elaborate uh, organism, uh, organization rather, to deceive the inspectors, to hide weapons of mass destruction, to do everything they can not to cooperate with the arms inspectors. It would appear, at least at this point, that the case has been made domestically, Bill, uh, Bill Crystal. We, a new Fox News Opinion Dynamics poll out today shows that 87% uh, of Americans believe that he has weapons of mass destruction. 81% of Americans believe that Iraq has ties to al-Qaeda. 67% of Americans support uh, the disarming and the removal of Saddam Hussein. These are numbers that many believed about three, four weeks ago might go the other way. Instead, they've gone up. Well, the president did an awfully good job in the State of the Union address, which was watched by tens of millions of Americans. I think a lot of people will watch uh, Secretary Powell today or certainly watch highlights of it tonight, um, and that will help. Uh, people do believe correctly. Look, he does have weapons of mass destruction. I mean, no one seriously doubts that the U.N. found them in, uh, throughout the 90s. The U.N. report in 1998 said there were huge numbers still unaccounted for. Defectors say he has them, and there are defectors who have actually worked on them. Uh, he has the weapons. He's not in compliance. Uh, you can say all of that and still say, well, it's another thing to go to war. And that's why I think it's important for the president and the administration to keep this uh, effort up in terms of convincing people that this is the only choice. The time really has run out because an awful lot of people of goodwill might say, well, Saddam's horrible, he has these weapons, but maybe we could let diplomacy work a little better. But if Saddam is absolutely refusing to cooperate in any way, What's the point of letting it, things get more dangerous as time goes on? Isn't it very difficult, even for nations where they will do anything to avoid war, like Germany, isn't it difficult to make a case when we know that they won't let the, the, the plane fly over, which they did have during, during the previous inspections, when they won't even let us interview the scientists, which was at the core of the UN resolution saying it was of the utmost importance? Well, the German case ultimately is it doesn't matter. If he has these weapons of mass destruction, we can deter him. He doesn't want to let his country be annihilated. Uh, and so 
too bad, he's a bad guy, he has these weapons, we can live with it. That is not this administration's view, it's not most Americans' view. After September 11th, that was the most important sentence in President Bush's State of the Union speech, that we cannot assume that we can contain a state, a regime like Saddam Hussein, because what happens if you wake up one day and you fail to contain him? We will not risk 9-11 with chemical or biological or nuclear weapons. And on that, I think some of the Europeans just don't want to face up to that. They don't want to face up to how dangerous the situation will be in five or ten years from now if we don't act today. But I think the president has brought, has certainly brought American public opinion along. He's brought public opinion. He's bringing public opinion along in the friendlier European countries. And I think ultimately he'll have a pretty, uh, as I say, a pretty large coalition behind him here as we move to disarm Saddam. A smiling Colin Powell on the screen at 25 minutes past 10 o'clock here in New York. Uh, George Tenet was there just a moment ago as well. Hans Blix now. Uh, Powell, Tenet, all the rest. You've been behind the scenes before enormous meetings like this. What has it been like at the White House and in inner circles over the last couple of days? You know, I'm not sure I've been quite in the most innermost <laughs> circles of, of, at that level. Um, oh, look, it's been very intense. And I suspect the president has made some personal decisions about what can and can't be released as we were discussing earlier. And as I say, I wouldn't minimize, I know they want to make a great public relations effort, but they are not going to put American lives at risk just to make a good splashy demonstration. And one really shouldn't underestimate the importance of some of this intelligence, especially if we know where some of the biological and chemical weapons are, especially if we're tracking some of the mobile units. Uh, I don't think we want the Iraqis to know how much we know about that. So I think you'll see Powell maybe make some general statements about that without revealing detailed intelligence. That war, you know, this president, I think, is very serious about the use of American force and the loss of American lives and Iraqi lives, mm -hmm. incidentally. And he's not going to risk that for the sake of a slightly glitzier presentation. Jim Mangle, Bill mentions that the, the president most likely made a number of these decisions personally. We've learned in writing since 9-11 how many of the enormous decisions were made specifically by him. Uh, we're talking about a president who many thought before m might be one who did a lot of listening and uh, didn't make a lot of decisions. We've learned that, in fact, that's not the case. How, how closely involved was he during this process with the top decision making? Yeah, that view of the president not being in control of his own administration has evaporated long since, Shep. Uh, he was involved. Uh, the, the National Security Council was in charge of this declassification process, obviously working interagency uh, with the CIA, uh, the FBI, the National Security Agency, which is responsible for signals, intelligence, communications intercepts, uh, and all of the rest of the intelligence community. They have been working night and day on this effort weighing very carefully what could be and what could not be declassified, what kinds of hints we might give the Iraqis of how we knew what they were up to. Uh, one official told me this morning, for instance, that as, w as we show satellite photographs, there are reasons that we pick some photographs and not others, reasons that we are interested in a particular place. That is because there are certain signals the Iraqis give off when they are up to no good. If we say anything about those signals, about the signature uh, that led us to take interest in these particular photographs, the Iraqis would then know about that and could change the way they do business. So there are things you have to do, even as you declassify things, you have to be very careful not to tell more than you need to. Uh, obviously, the administration wants to make as powerful and compelling a case as it can. This is the critical moment in this debate, a point at which all of the world and all of the Security Council in particular will be watching, a point at which Powell's arguments can turn the day. So it is critical that they make a compelling presentation that they offer at the best evidence they have without going too far and telling the Iraqis what they know. It is clear that as you get closer to a decision to go to war, it is less important to protect that intelligence because uh, some of it will evaporate as you move to military action anyway. But clearly there are lives at stake. If you, when you use a signals intelligence, communications intercepts, they know how, what you were able to hear. When you use satellite photos, they know what you're able to see and realize how better to hide their weapons programs. When you use human intelligence, they may be able to figure out who it is and those people turn up dead. In fact, Saddam has a reputation for killing any number of people just because he suspects there may be someone in that group. So they have to be very careful, but this is a critical moment. This is a 
historical moment in which the administration has taken a great deal of care to put together the most compelling case it can without jeopardizing the sources of intelligence. Bob, Bob Baer is a former CIA operative uh, who's been involved in this collection process over the years. Uh, Bob, Jim, Jim's point is, is well taken here. They, they want to give enough, but they can't give too much. How much danger can that be? Uh, there's a lot of sources and methods that they definitely don't want to compromise and they can't compromise, especially if we're going to go to a war, so they can't include the whole package. They need to take some highlights and make a compelling picture by showing this fabric of deception, which we all know occurs. And this is really a very important public relations, it's a necessary public relations effort to convince the American people and the Europeans that this guy remains a danger and isn't going to go away. But in fact, they're telling the French and the Germans that he's a lot worse than the evidence we're presenting. No, I think that's right, Shep. You know, this president remembers that bin Laden was able to carry out 9-11 because he discovered, because of American carelessness, uh, that we were able to monitor his cell phone conversations a couple of years ago. He changed his mode of communicating among his uh, subordinates, and they had pretty good security, unfortunately, before September 11th. And then he may well have gotten away in November in Afghanistan, again, because he realized what we were able to do was able to change his, his pattern of operation. So I think we're going to be very careful on that. The other point I would make, picking up on what Jim said, Steve Hadley, Condi Rice's deputy at the National Security Council, who's in the White House, coordinated the interagency process between the Defense Department, CIA, uh, our spy agency, the National Security Agency, um, the State Department, etc. Steve Hadley is, works directly for Condi Rice, for Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice obviously works directly for the President. This was run out of the White House. This was very sensitive. The key decisions were made in the White House. Obviously, Secretary of State Powell, I'm sure, shaped the presentation of the evidence. But again, I would say it's not just that you don't want to compromise your sources and methods, as sure. they say in the intelligence business. If we know something that we need to hit on the first day of the war, we very much don't want the Iraqis to know what we know. Colin Powell on the screen now, <laughs> blowing a kiss to his, to his fans across the room, it would appear. Uh, Mohammed al-Baradai and uh, Hans Blix there just a moment ago, speaking with the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. And uh, Jim Engel at the White House, there was a time not so long ago where it seemed at least that Hans Blix was viewed as not so friendly toward the United States and the administration's position. Over time, that seems to have changed, and he's come around to agree in principle, it would appear, at least with the administration. How did that happen? Well, he's tried to take a neutral position, as he must, Shep. But the fact is, as he looks at the facts, he often comes to the same conclusions the U.S. D reaches when it looks at the facts. Uh, everyone knows what the Iraqis are up to. Uh, Blix, <coughs> pardon me, Blix is on the front end of that. He experiences that, that deception more than anyone else. Uh, I think it's interesting, too, to note here, Shep, as you see Secretary Powell passing through that room here over the last few minutes, what a celebrity he is, and I think it's fair to use that term, even in the international community. As you see people come up hugging him, shaking his hand, uh, coming up to greet him. This man has a great deal of credibility. His presentation today could change the views of lots of these nations or at least give them something they can point to as they begin to shift their view of what is necessary in, deal in dealing with Saddam Hussein. All right, Jim Engel at the White House, uh, he'll be with us for analysis on the back, as will Bill Crystal and Bob Baer. Uh, we'll also be speaking with our Washington Managing Editor, Britt Hume, when all of this is over, uh, to say a, a historic moment is one that we are about to witness, uh, is, is maybe to understate the case. I'm watching on another monitor here as we look live in Baghdad, uh, as officials are gathered around an enormous conference Your table colleagues, and watching on a television. Yashka Fischer now, the German Foreign Minister, to introduce Colin Powell. meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is before the Council in document S Agenda 4701, which reads, quote, the situation between Iraq and Kuwait, end of quote. Unless I hear any ob objection, I shall consider the agenda adopted. The agenda is adopted. I should like to inform the Council that I have received a letter from the representative of Iraq in which he requests to be invited to participate in the discussion of the item on the Council's agenda. In accordance with the usual practice, I propose, with the consent of the Council, 
to invite that representative to participate in the discussion without the right to vote in accordance with the relevant provisions of the Charter and Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedures. There being no objection, it is so decided. I invite the representative of Iraq to take a seat at the Council table. I welcome the presence of the Distinguished Secretary General, His Excellency Mr. Kofi Annan, at this meeting. I also welcome the presence of Dr. Hans Blix, Executive Chairman of the United Nations Monitoring, Verification and Inspection Commission, and Dr. Mohamed El Baradei, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Members of the Council who wish to address questions to Dr. Blix and Dr. El Baradei are invited to do so at the luncheon to be held following the adjournment of this meeting. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. The purpose of this meeting is to hear a presentation by the United States. In order for us to work within our timetable, Participants are urged to speak for not more than seven minutes. <laughs> 